share some things with you that's concerning um, the subject of God's rewards. You know, God is a God of rewards. Um, in case you, you just didn't know that, God is a God of rewards. And he's interested in rewarding you. Amen? And so he's not holding out. But there are some things that you need to do. And so the message I've titled is God's Rewards from Sending Faith-Based Nemail. Faith-Based Nemail. You know, if you're going to get God's attention on anything, then you got to come to him on his terms. And so under his terms, what it is is that God rewards faith. He doesn't re reward crying, boo-hooing, jumping up and down, and spinning around backwards. That's not going to get it done with him. God is a God who responds to faith. That is what it is. That's your currency exchange between you and heaven is faith. Your currency exchange in the earth, if you were going to acquire some merchandise, if you were going out to purchase a TV, then you could use your credit card, you could use cash or whatever. But you've got to have currency in order for you to have that exchange. Well, the exchange between you and the Heavenly Father in how you appropriate things that are in the spirit world and bring them into manifestation, the currency, as it were, is faith. Nothing else other than faith. So we need to open up and understand how this currency works, amen? And so what we're going to do is look at this prayer approach and why a prayer of faith. If you would in your Bible, please turn to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. We'll start there with this foundation. Our opening scripture. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith is not a movement. Faith is not just something a particular group in the body of Christ began to, to speak and blow forth and bring it to us as, it, as that began to take place back in the 70s and the 80s. We had particular ministry gifts that God anointed to bring forth and blaze faith into the body of Christ because we needed it. And we still need it. We still need to understand. But the bottom line is that this is what we're supposed to live by. So if we're supposed to live by it, then we need to know that prayer will work through it because he said we're supposed to live by faith. Amen? Now, if you go over to the book of Habakkuk, which is over in the Old Testament. Amen? When you get there, you go to Habakkuk chapter 2. And what I'll say about this is that in the book of Habakkuk, what many people hear about, they hear about the subject of the vision, running with the vision. And that is in this, set of, in this particular book. But when you go down to 2.4, it says, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by Pastor Knight's faith. But the just shall live by Pastor Rob's faith. But the just shall live by Minister Audrey's faith. Didn't say that. Said the just shall live by his faith. So you need to understand, you need to know something about what faith is and how it works. Amen? We're supposed to live by it. From faith to faith and glory to glory, we're supposed to live by it. It should be a part of our day. 
not just when disaster happens, not just when problems arise, not just when little Johnny decided that he was going to kind of act up in school, not just when the child wound up in a position where they're before the police officer. That's not what God's design was about you living by faith. He designed you to live by faith day by day, moment by moment, 24-7, 365. That was God's design. But now we got off track. Much of the reason why we got off track, because we hadn't been taught. And then what it is is that there's things like this that we let slip and let go. And then we're trying to get many of our things done under our own power, under our power, not his power. But his anointing is the burden removing, yoke destroying power that God delivers in these situations. So what we need to understand is how to activate that. If you go to Galatians 3.11, so I'm moving you over into the New Testament. And praise God for Galatians. There's some tremendous nuggets in there about what Christ has done for you, particular to Galatians chapter 3, and I would just advise you to spend some time there. Galatians chapter 3, when you get there, go down to verse 11. It says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live. By faith. We've seen this message Old Testament. We've seen it New Testament. Now we're going to go over to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to begin to get some insight about this thing about living by faith. Because we need it. It's a basic foundation of any prayer and how you go before God to receive from God. You have to do it by faith. When you get to Hebrews chapter 11, what I'm going to do is just back you up three scriptures to Hebrews 10, 38. We're going to see this again. And you know, the word of God talks about, you know, let every word be established through the mouth of two or three witnesses. I've already given you three. I'm getting ready to give you number four on this subject. And so in Hebrews 10, 38, it says, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, I could just stop there and say, well, you know, if you're not moving along by faith, then uh, it says here that he shall have no pleasure in him. So we got to know how to operate this way so that we can, as it were, get our prayers answered and that God will reward us on the opposite end. Because God is not, he, he's clearly stated in here, his soul shall have no pleasure in him. Then it goes on in verse 39, it says, But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. And then it goes on in chapter 11 to talk about what many people call the faith hall of fame. It goes on to talk about Abel. It goes on to talk about Enoch. It goes on to talk about Noah. Goes on down verse 8 talks about Abraham. It goes on to talk about they sojourn. It goes on to talk about Sarah. Now, keep in mind, something that gets overlooked about all of this, these people did not have what you got. They didn't have Genesis to Revelation to look at, to read. All they had was the ability to hear God and obey. Yet in here time and time again, it talked about that the just living by faith. And these people, as it were, they were not born again. So that ought to say something to you too. They didn't have the spirit of God on the inside of them like you do. But yet, we see in the Old Testament, beginning with Abel, he offered that very first sacrifice that's recorded under God in faith. His brother Cain didn't. And so, as it were, Cain got upset that his wasn't accepted, and then we see the first murder take place. 
but God designed us to operate by faith. Amen. And it's a covenant lifestyle. And once you get connected to understanding the covenant you got, it's easy to approach God boldly. It really is. Some people are approaching God with a bit of timidity and just being timid because they're not sure or assured that God will answer them and that God is interested. And what I will say to you, well, let's, let's say this together. Um, God so loved the world. Would you say that? God so loved the world that he gave his son, Jesus, for me. Now, we could just make this adjustment say, I am so loved by God that he sent Jesus to the cross for me. See, earlier in the service, Minister Audrey talked about, you know, saying that I love you. But what you need to recognize is that God loves you. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to the cross. Think about this. If you could just begin to imagine in your mind, you know, over in Isaiah 52 and 53, it talks about the description of what Jesus looked like on the cross. It talked about his visage was so marred that people didn't want to look at it. They didn't want to look at it because he was so marred. Crown of thorns plaited on his head. Stakes, long stakes in his hands upon the cross. Had been beat and beard pulled, hit with a with a whip that had bones and, and different things in it, that had, as it were, they talked about 39 stripes. Just imagine the blood that was streaming down from Jesus on the cross. And if it had only been one person on the earth at that time, and that was you, he died. Faith in your you prayer and enter that throne room with confidence because you know what Jesus did for you and you could go in there and say, Jesus, I know you love me. You ought to have a bold confidence at going to the throne room of grace. Now let's just think about that for a moment. Grace unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. You mean to tell me I boldly can go to that throne room of unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor? I couldn't earn it if I wanted to. I had nothing I got, I, got, I got nothing I could do in this life to be good enough to go to the throne room of grace. Now, understanding that, then hey, I can go there with complete freedom. Complete freedom. Knowing that, I, that I'm not there because I deserve to be there. I'm there because of the mercy. I'm there because of the blood. I'm there because of the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of those things is why I can go to that throne room and why I can go to him with a faith-based prayer. Because that's what I got. And that's covenant. God has a covenant that he's established and God will not break that covenant. In fact, I, I'm going to just say this in passing by, and then I got something else I'm going to go to. You know that Abraham was in his 70s when God started talking to him about the seed, started talking to him about Isaac. He was already past what we would consider to be the normal time for a man to be, you know, in a position where he's productive. But he spoke to him and spoke to Sarah about this process. Of course, initially, Sarah kind of laughed because she's like, hey, you know, we're, I'm way down the road about this. <laughs> How's this going to happen to me? And I really believe, you know, when you look at the scripture and you compare the birth of Isaac to the birth of Christ, there's some interesting parallels there. Because what it is is that God had them to use faith in order to cause the seed of Isaac to come into the earth. And yet when Mary, who was a virgin, when the time come, God had her to use her faith to conceive the seed of the word in her womb. 
See, Mary conceived that seed. There was a question that was asked, and she said, well, when she heard from the angel, the angel said, well, this is going to take place. And she said, well, okay, well, how is it? She didn't say, no, I don't think this is going to happen. She just asked the question, how is it going to happen? And then she said, be it unto me. She received the word spoken. And from that part on, God could move on her womb to do what it was he wanted to do. And, of course, we now know that there's a supernatural move on Sarah's womb and a supernatural move on, on Abraham in order to get this done. But what I wanted to say about that covenant is this. God honored that covenant, and you need to realize this because I think some people miss the idea about God and that covenant because they got their mind focused on some things about the blessing and the curse of Abraham. But there's something interesting about God and his process. God cut a covenant with Abraham. He had him get some animals. He had him shed some blood. And Abraham had to walk a certain way. And God moved a certain way down through there. All about covenant. And let me help you understand this. God did not need, as it were, to have a covenant for himself. That covenant was to get Abraham to trust him. That's why he showed himself up out there. So that he could show the fact to Abraham, I'm bonded with you. And to you and your seed will these covenant blessings occur. So he did that. Now, how strong is that covenant? Well, um, we know the story. We know that there was a child that was born named Ishmael before the promised child came along. But you know what? God didn't back off on the covenant. Ishmael was blessed. That's just how committed God's loyalty is to that covenant. And you need to realize that God is just as committed to you with that covenant.